Hello, welcome to the next lecture on uh, the semantic web and uh, linked data. And today uh, we are going to talk about some first uh, vocabularies that uh, you actually can use in, uh, in your data and that you will encounter um, on the web. Um, but before that, uh, let's just quickly um, remind ourselves of uh, the most important linked data principles, these four, uh, which says, say that um, all things uh, on the web should be identified by IRIs. Those IRIs should be HTTP or HTTPS IRIs. And when someone looks up that IRI, uh, they get information about that thing in RDF. And uh, that information, the data should contain links to other uh, relevant things, uh, which makes it actually linked data, the, the fourth principle. Uh, without the fourth principle, uh, it would be like uh, in the first lecture, like I showed you when you have a wiki page and all the links would be suddenly gone and you couldn't go anywhere from that wiki page. So uh, it is similar with, uh, with data. So the links to other uh, data sets are, uh, are important here. We also talked about the RDF data model, which is the standard uh, for representation of data on the web. And uh, it is a graph-based data model. And the graph can be described using RDF statements or RDF triples. The triple consists of a subject, a predicate, and an object where uh, the subject and the predicate are, are identified by IRIs. Uh, the subject can also be a blank node. And the object can be uh, again, a thing identified by an IRI, uh, it can be a blank node, or it can be a literal. We also talked about classes, um, which are used for typing of things. So if I want to say that uh, this is actually a person, uh, I can do it by using the special RDF type predicate. Uh, and uh, I can say that this person is this thing actually is a person. And then this is what is called a class. It identifies the set of all people in this case. Uh, and it is the object of the statement with the RDF type predicate. It is also a resource. It is also a thing. But in this case, it is called a class because it represents the whole set of instances. Right, so this is a quick recap of uh, what we talked about up to now. And uh, we have also mentioned vocabularies. The vocabularies are lists of um, class definitions and predicate definitions, where we have the IRI of the predicate or a class, along with the meaning of the predicate or a class. And those vocabularies are both uh, machine readable, they are represented in RDF as well, and they are typically um, accompanied by a human readable HTML document. And um, we have seen that uh, with uh, the fourth vocabulary that we had in uh, the tutorial. Um, <clears throat> so that actually was the first vocabulary we came uh, into contact with. Um, and even that is not entirely true because we also talked about RDFS, RDF schema, which is the vocabulary used to uh, define other vocabularies or one of the vocabularies used for this, but the simplest one and the easiest uh, easiest to, to understand. Uh, and it, in RDFS, we learned how to define our own predicates and our own classes so that we can use those in our data. Right, so today we are going to talk about um, some of the most common vocabularies found on the web. And we'll start with uh, the simplest and most basic thing, and that is a name for something. So imagine that uh, you want to publish your data as linked data in RDF, and you want to have a triple that something is called and a human readable label of that thing um, or a name. This is also one of the patterns that you should follow when uh, publishing data uh, on the web that uh, you should 
provide a human readable name for every resource that you publish data about, because in the end, the resource will be processed by some application, uh, which um, has a human interface and uh, you will have to present the data to people and uh, people won't appreciate when you show them IRIs, they need human readable labels. And for that, you need to have those labels in the data. Now, the question is, which predicates to use for um, names of things? So the problem is that when two authors of data on the web would think of this problem independently, uh, or maybe even three or more, uh, one would come up with a predicate, which is called a name. Another one would come up with a predicate, which is called a label. And the third one would come up with a predicate called a title, because, for instance, they are working with a data set of uh, books, and uh, books have titles. So they would use their own predicates, publish their data on the web, and the data would not be interoperable, even uh, regarding a um, basic thing like a name for something. So there is a need to, uh, to have this standardized, to have a standardized way of saying this is called something in a human, uh, human readable way. Um, in 1995, in Dublin, uh, there was a metadata workshop. Um, it was mostly librarians uh, and uh, they discussed some metadata items that uh, each book, for instance, should have. And uh, this Dublin is not the Dublin in Ireland, it is a Dublin in the USA. Um, and in this workshop, they came up with uh, 15 basic metadata items that can be used to describe a book. Um, and uh, those 15 items are here. So you can see that there is, uh, there is title, description, identifier, uh, author, and so on. So, so basic metadata for description of, uh, of books. Of course, in 1995, there was no RDF at that time, uh, but that doesn't prevent anyone from establishing a list of terms and their meaning, um, only to be able to use those terms and their meanings in the context of RDF. Um, there needs to be an RDF vocabulary defined, which is the case. Um, and uh, this is called the Dublin Core vocabulary. And it is one of the most uh, reused vocabularies uh, in, in the web of data. Um, an interesting thing here is that uh, actually Dublin Core uh, defines two namespaces, two vocabularies. One is Dublin Core elements. Uh, and one is Dublin core terms. Uh, in older examples, older data sets, you may find actually uh, the Dublin core elements they, uh, namespace used, uh, but this one is deprecated for, uh, for the purposes of uh, usage on the web uh, in, in data. And that's because uh, the terms in the RDF sense were not clearly defined here. So what they did, uh, was that uh, they redefined them in the Dublin core terms namespace, uh, linking to the old ones, of course, uh, but the proper definitions that we will use in the data, uh, those definitions are in the Dublin core terms namespace. And that is uh, also uh, prefixed uh, commonly as, uh, as DC terms or DCT. Um, however, um, always, when working with the Dublin core, uh, with the Dublin core vocabulary, always check which uh, prefix or how the prefix is defined, because sometimes it happens that uh, there is just the DC prefix, which often enough is the, the, the wrong one. But sometimes uh, when people fix this, they just uh, change the IRI of the prefix to the correct one, but left the prefix as DC. So. Um, this is just to warn you a little, little bit to check uh, which prefixes you use when working with Dublin Core. Uh, now, if you take a look at the actual document of the vocabulary, you will see definitions like these. So again, those are very similar to, the, to those we have seen in the full vocab vocabulary. So this is a record or a section uh, regarding um, Dublin Core Publisher. 
Um, and uh, we can see the URI here. So that's the predicate that we will use in the data. We can see the human readable label and description, which we also can find in the data. Um, and um, there is a, uh, yeah, there is range includes and uh, sub property of. So now, sub property of, we already know uh, from uh, last time when I talked about RDFS. Um, so this means, and this is the link to the elements namespace to the original one, that uh, every time a subject and object is connected using the publisher uh, predicate, it can be interpreted as if they were also connected using the elements, the original one, the elements publisher uh, predicate. So that, that's the sub property of. Uh, and range includes is uh, actually uh, a recent development. Um, before, there was just uh, the plain old range as uh, we have discussed in RDFS. So that was uh, RDFS range and uh, it was uh, Dublin core agent, which meant that uh, every time this predicate was used in data, uh, the object would automatically become an instance of uh, an agent. Um, however, this uh, caused some, uh, some issues. Um, let me illustrate uh, on another property and uh, not range, but domain. Uh, and let's say we have the property weight uh, saying that something has some, some weight, right? And so now we have a data set of cars and we want to specify a weight of a car. So we use this property. And we also have a data set of, uh, let's say people, and we want to specify the weights. So we again use the same property. Now, if this property uh, has the domain of uh, cars and uh, also a domain of people, because we want to use it in both, uh, both instances, there is a problem because uh, how the specification of a domain and the range works is that uh, uh, when this predicate is used, the subject becomes an instance of what is the domain and uh, also the object becomes the instance of what is uh, the range. So in the case of uh, weight and people and cars, every subject used with the weight property would become an instance of a car and an instance of a person, which doesn't make any sense of course, because there is no person which would, who would also be a car. So uh, it doesn't make sense. And uh, this was so, so common mistake in, in defining RDFS vocabularies that actually uh, schema.org, which is another vocabulary and uh, later also Dublin core, which is the oldest vocabulary uh, or one of the oldest, um, they switched this to uh, say that the range includes agent. This means that from the usage of this predicate, it no longer, um, when you use this predicate, it no longer means that the object is an instance of this. Uh, class. It only, only means that it might be because the range includes this class, but uh, uh, there is no rule saying that uh, the object will be an instance of agent. So this is a relaxation um, of, of the definition and uh, you can then uh, use the term more freely without worrying about the side effects that the objects become instances of agent in this case. Right, so uh, the complete uh, Dublin core terms uh, namespace has uh, been expanded over the years. Uh, so uh, it, it still includes the original 15 uh, items, but it in includes also many more. And uh, the original ones are uh, enlarged in the list. Uh, and I think those are the most, uh, most useful. And I think you will, um, end up using some of those at least in your semester projects. Now we have already seen the usage of uh, the CDM's title in the original motivating example in our first lecture uh, where we had the public contract uh, about playground revitalizations and uh, we use Dublin call the CDM's title uh, to actually connect the name, the human readable name to the, to, to the thing 
representing the public contract. Um, so we basically already know this one. So from now on, whenever you have something similar to a book or maybe a data set or something like that, and you want to say that it has a name, you can use Dublin Core title for that. And everyone on the web will understand what you mean by that. So that's Dublin Core. Uh, let's move on to another uh, vocabulary, which is uh, reused quite a lot. And uh, this one is SCOS. Uh, what it is used for? Well, code lists and uh, taxonomies. Now, the question is, what is a code list? Uh, code list is, um, in this case, a uh, enumeration of values, basically. Um, so uh, here we have a list of uh, grades, a, B, C, D, E, F, or states of um, bachelor theses or types of theses, or from uh, TripAdvisor, I think this is the uh, categories of uh, tourist attractions. So all those enumerations uh, are considered code lists. And again, we have the same problem uh, that if we wouldn't have a standard for this, everyone would uh, represent those code lists differently. Um, and therefore there is a standard for it. Um, one side note, with the human readable labels, there are many options actually uh, of how, which predicate you can use for that. We have seen RDFS label used for uh, describing classes and predicates using RDFS. We have seen already Dublin core title. Uh, and uh, in SCOS, there is also uh, a property um, which can be used for attaching a human readable label to a thing. But it has, in its scope, it will have a finer um, defined meaning. So uh, it is quite distinguishable uh, when to use which one. So this leads us to SCOS, Simple Knowledge Organization System. Um, the advantage of SCOS is that actually for taxonomies and uh, code lists, there is no other uh, standard. So there is just SCOS. So whenever you have uh, a code list or a taxonomy or a enumeration of uh, possible values for something, you will use SCOS for that. It is a W3C recommendation, which means it is a web standard. Um, and uh, yeah, the prefix is SCOS. And again, you will find this URI, uh, for instance, using the prefix.tc uh, web service. And uh, the most core thing in, uh, in SCOS is called a concept. And it is a very generic thing. Um, basically, it is defined as an idea or a notion, um, unit of thought. So uh, it is very generic. And from this definition, it would seem that basically anything can be a concept. And actually that is true. So almost anything can be viewed as a concept and described as a concept using SCOS. Um, in our case, we will use concept for description uh, of uh, the individual items of a particular code list. So for instance, here uh, we have sites and landmarks. So that's one concept. And uh, transportation would be another concept. And because we can, uh, we want to say that something, uh, a part of a code list, a code list item is a concept. In RDF, we do it this way. We attach or define an IRI for it. And we say it is a SCOS concept. And that's it. Now, like this, we can define all those um, code list items. Um, but uh, those would be separated from each other. And uh, there would be no uh, unifying uh, thing or resource. And that unifying thing or resource actually representing the whole code list is SCOS concept scheme. So this is another class defined by SCOS. And this one actually represents the whole taxonomy of the whole code list. Um, right, so in the example, we can see again sites and landmarks, which is a concept like we had before. Uh, but this time we have it attached to a particular concept scheme. So here again, we define um, attraction types 
which is a concept scheme representing this, uh, this code list. And uh, we already can see uh, actually three, three predicates which can be used to attach a concept to a concept scheme. One uh, says that uh, the concept scheme has a top concept and it links to the sites and landmarks here. Um, from the name of the predicate, uh, it can be quite intuitively seen that um, the top here is quite important. And that's because SCOS is not intended just for flat code lists, but also for hierarchical ones. And therefore, when you have a hierarchy, there is a top concept or multiple top concepts. And this predicate is used to denote that this is the top concept of some hierarchy. And there is also a inverse property, uh, top concept of, which you can use with the concept to actually link to um, the concept scheme uh, of which this concept is a top concept. Um, so this is for hierarchies and for flat lists, um, or actually for any concept belonging to any concept scheme, you can always use scores in scheme to actually link the concept to the concept scheme. Right, so this isn't so difficult, right? We already know how to represent a, a code list and how to represent each of the code list items as a SCOS concept scheme and its uh, concept. Now, um, coming back actually to what I was saying about Dublin Core, uh, you can see that uh, if you were to, uh, to, to present this data to a user, for instance, in an application such as this one, or the ones we had seen before, uh, there would be a slight problem because uh, if you would have all the items defined like this, um, you would have only the IRIs of the items, which are important, of course, because they distinguish uh, among the items. But if an uh, end user, a user of an application uh, would uh, be presented with uh, those IRIs, they wouldn't get the meaning, right? So what is missing here are the human readable labels. So now we have uh, in data, the, the individual concepts distingu distinguished, we can use them, but we don't know how to actually present them to people. For that, we need uh, lexical labels. And uh, in SCOS, there are three ways of attaching a label uh, to a thing. And uh, the first one is a pref label, which again, intuitively is a preferred label, which means that there will be other labels which are not so preferred. Um, because this is a preferred label, uh, it can be defined only once per each human uh, language. So it means there can be one preferred label in Czech, one preferred label in English and so on, but there cannot be two preferred labels for Czech, for instance, because then uh, it is not clear which one is the preferred one. So that's the limitation here. Um, and actually, you can use the SCOS pref label predicate even outside of SCOS, meaning uh, in data sets uh, where you do not have any code list and, so, and such. Uh, every time you want to say that something has a preferred label, you can use uh, SCOS pref label for that. Now, uh, the other labels are alternate labels or alt labels. So again, uh, they are human readable labels in multiple languages possibly. Uh, and now because they are alternative, uh, you can have multiple alternative labels for each language. There's no, uh, no problem there. Um, right, and there is a third option and that's a so-called hidden label. Now this might seem a little bit strange why we would have a label and then hide it, right? But uh, this one is used for misspellings, for instance, uh, when you can imagine an application having um, some data to be searched um, by people uh, represented using, using SCOS. And uh, in this data, you know that some items are almost always used in a wrong way. Um, so you have two options when you have this situation. You can say, okay, I know this is wrong uh, and you should know it too. So when you search for something uh, using a wrong string, you won't find it. Or, which is the more user-friendly way, you can also store those commonly used but wrong labels as hidden labels 
and use them, for instance, in search. So an example here is um, a concept for animals, let's say, and you can see that it has one preferred label in English, uh, one preferred label in French, and then uh, two alternate labels in English and French, and one hidden label where we have a misspelling, an error. By, by saving this or having this represented as a hidden label, we say we want to use it somehow, but it is not um, a correct label for that thing. Right, so like this, we can attach human readable labels to concepts and concept schemes. Um, there is uh, another commonly used predicate for concepts and that's notation. Because typically when you have a, again, code list or concept scheme, uh, already present in some information system, let's say, uh, like uh, the grades. Uh, you have uh, typically the, the label of that item, like um, excellent or very good uh, or average or something like that. But then you also have the machine readable code, like A, B, C, or one, two, three, or something like that, which is not a human readable label, but it is used to identify that item um, within some information system. So when you have this, you want to also preserve it in uh, RDF, of course. And for that, uh, you can use the cost notation uh, predicate like this. Uh, with the cost notation predicate, uh, you again have some options of specifying um, the, the actual data type of the literal here. So it is always a machine readable string. So you don't use uh, language tags with SCOS notation. You have the pref label and alt label for that. Um, however, you might want to express that the string has some internal structure. It is not required. You can leave it as a plain string, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to, you can define your own data type and say that the uh, literal has a data type, which is described somehow, for instance, like, three digits, then a dot, and then four digits, or something similar. So this is SCOS notation. And uh, this basically allow us now to take a look at a complete uh, concept scheme, which appears somewhere on the web. And uh, one good source of uh, concept schemes is the web uh, EU vocabularies. Um, it is a uh, website with uh, RDF data um, containing multiple, or I would say many um, code lists used across Europe. Um, it is man maintained by the EU Publications Office. And uh, this is an example of one of um, such uh, concept schemes. And it is the one describing continents. Um, and uh, this is an extract of uh, the RDF title file, which actually uh, contains the whole, um, the whole code list. And what we can see here is the prefixes section, of course, and then Africa here is a concept. It, it is in the scheme of continents. So continents is a content scheme and uh, it has a preferred label. And actually uh, the advantage of the EU vocabularies is that uh, they have typically uh, the concepts in all EU languages. So here we can see a concept Africa, uh, which has labels in all EU languages, such as Czech and English, of course, but also other ones. And uh, then there is America, which looks the same. And then the continent is a concept scheme, which has in this case RDFS label and SCOS prep label. So why I mentioned this uh, EU vocabularies web uh, specifically is because um, it might be beneficial for you to actually use those code lists in your data when applicable. So when you have, uh, let's say, uh, statistics for EU countries or actually for any countries, you will find an EU vocabulary code list uh, containing all those countries. So you may use that code list and when you do, and uh, when you would publish your data, uh, there is a higher chance someone else will be able to understand your data because uh, of the reused 
European uh, code list represented in scores. Right, so uh, this is a real world example of a flat code list. And uh, I also mentioned hierarchies. With the hierarchies, we need other kinds of relationships on the predicates so that we are able to express those hierarchies. And uh, there is a, again, a small hierarchy of those predicates in SCOS. Um, the super uh, property or super predicate here is semantic relation. That one is actually kind of abstract, so it is not used in the data anywhere, but it is the common ancestor uh, of all those predicates in the sub property of uh, hierarchy. And the most generic one is, um, is related. That one is not used for building hierarchies. That one is actually used uh, for saying that there is some kind of relation between one concept and another one, but we are not sure or not able to express what kind of relation it is. But still, it is uh, worth mentioning that there is some kind of relation, and then the user of the data needs to uh, decide for themselves what actually the relation uh, is. Uh, but for hierarchies, we can use cost broader and cost narrower in our data. Uh, those two actually represent those, um, those are represented by the, uh, by the red arrows. Those are the uh, cost broader relations actually. So we have a concept D which points using cost broader to the concept B and a concept B which points again using scos broader to concept A. And then we have a concept C, which also points to concept A using scos broader. Now, those are the, the broader or narrower, which would be the other way around if we chose to represent it that way. Those uh, occur in uh, actual data. So in your data set, you would use broader or narrower. But then if you would have, um, um, reasoning enabled RDF database, for instance, or you would perform inference on top of your data, which is uh, basically a der derivation of new facts based on the facts that you already have. And by facts, I mean the RDF statements and based on some rules, uh, you would be able to infer, for instance, that D is, uh, uh, should point using the broader transitive to A because from the fact that uh, D points to B and B points to A, you could infer uh, also the transitive relation. So those um, narrow transitive and broader transitive are actually defined in SCOS, but they are um, intended to be used only for inferred triples and not for those triples actually present in the data. Right, so like this, you can have a hierarchy of concepts um, and uh, yeah, um, besides the concept schemes, there is another, uh, another class called collection. And uh, basically you can group a set of concepts in a collection without having to define a concept scheme for them. So it is another, uh, another view of, uh, of a group of concepts. And this collection can be ordered and unordered. If you have an unordered collection, you can use these cost member predicates to actually point to those concepts belonging to this group. And if you have the ordered collection, use the member list. And then the member list is the RDF list, the linked list uh, that we talked about in the RDF data model. And you can define an ordering uh, among uh, the, the members of this collection. And uh, the last thing uh, I want to say about SCOS here is uh, mappings. So let's imagine that we have a SCOS concept scheme for uh, colors and uh, we have a Czech one and then we have a European one. Um, this may be uh, not the ideal example because there are no like hierarchical relations among colors typically. Um, so yeah, let's... Uh, and this is also another good example for this actually, but it uh, doesn't matter. I think you will get it. Um, so um, let's say we have two uh, SCOS concept schemes for the same thing, such as sexes or color or something. And um, they are both described using SCOS as 
separate cross concept schemes. Now, if I want to use those, there is a problem because I don't know which concept from the first concept scheme um, rep or is <laughs> similar to which concept in the other concept scheme. And uh, the author of the second concept scheme or uh, someone else can help me by establishing the mapping relations. So mapping relations are intended to be used among concepts from different concept schemes. And uh, again, the mapping relations are similar to the semantic relations we had before. So there is an abstract ancestor of all of those. And then there is, and let's start from, from, the, from the bottom. So there is narrow match, uh, which is um, similar to uh, the cost narrower um, predicate. However, this one leads from a concept of one concept scheme to a concept of another concept scheme and says that, um, yeah, uh, the second concept is somehow narrower than the first one, but in a different concept scheme. Then the opposite is broad match and uh, the counterpart to SCOS related is related match. And I want to say that the one concept has something to do with the other concept, but I'm not able to say what exactly, but still I, I say there is a relation. And uh, the most useful ones, or actually the, the most interesting ones are exact match and close match. Um, exact match is quite intuitive again. It says that the concept from one concept scheme is exactly the same as, or represents exactly the same thing as the other uh, concept from another concept scheme. And close match uh, says a similar thing. However, the difference between close and exact match is that one is transitive and one is not. So if you say that A is a close match of B and B is a close match of C, uh, you cannot say that A is a close match of C. That's uh, the close match, but with exact match, it is transitive and you can say that. Right, so that is SCOS. And uh, I expect that uh, whenever you have a code list in your data, which is almost always, you will use SCOS to represent it. Uh, it also has to do with um, the uh, link, uh, not label, uh, pattern that um, I may have showed you uh, in the tutorial, uh, which basically says whenever you would repeat a literal or something, think if actually, uh, or think about if actually this shouldn't be a concept with a label and uh, if you shouldn't actually use a link to that concept instead of repeating the same literal again and again. For instance, if you have a data set of cars and cars have colors and you would have 20 red cars represented as an instance of a car and the color would be a literal red, that is a bit weird. And uh, the better way of, uh, of doing that is actually creating a concept scheme of colors uh, where you have entities for each color or concepts for each color with their labels. And then from your data, you link to those concepts instead of having a predicate with the red literal value for your cars. Right. So that is cost. Any questions so far? No. Right. So now a question for you. Um, who knows what is a statistical data cube? Okay. So no one. So this is a statistical data cube. Now let's forget for a minute about RDF and data and all that. Uh, this is pure statistics. This is called a data cube. Uh, why is it called a cube? Because it actually is a three dimensional set of uh, observations. Um, we, have, uh, we have dimensions here. The one dimension is the time dimension. The second dimension is uh, area uh, where something was measured. And the third dimension is the sex of the person uh, for, for whom something was measured. Uh, so we have three dimensions. And uh, when we have a value on each of the dimensions, uh, we can identify a measure or an observation. And uh, the cell of this table is an observation. And the value here is what was measured. Now, um, maybe it is not clear what exactly was measured here, but that's not the point uh, so far. 
Um, the point here is that uh, this is called a data cube. It can have uh, more dimensions. For instance, we could have uh, like age groups uh, dimension, then we would have four dimensional uh, data cube, uh, or we could have just the time dimension, then we would have one dimensional data cube called a time series um, and so on. So this is called a data cube and it is used in statistics. And uh, many of you have actually chosen some kind of statistical data set uh, as one of your data sets in the semester project. And uh, this means that uh, I will expect you to use the appropriate vocabulary for that. And that is what uh, we are going to talk about now. So this is a statistical data cube. And now we will talk about how to represent it in RDF. Any questions before we get to the RDF part about the statistical data cube? I think it is quite straightforward. One thing I didn't mention, I will get to it, but uh, let's mention it right away. Uh, if you want to say that uh, this measurement has a unit, for instance, that this is years, um, you can describe this using an attribute. So you have uh, dimensions, this, this, and this. Then you have the measurement, and then you have an attribute, which is a property of basically, well, the observation, which is represented by the cell. Um, and it says the units or um, some multiplication factors. For instance, I could say that this is in thousands or in millions. Um, so all those are attributes of uh, the observation. So we have uh, attributes, measurements, dimensions. Uh, and now we are going to um, describe those in RDF. For this, again, there is one standard, the RDF data cube vocabulary. It is again a web standard W3C recommendation, and it is based on SDMX, uh, which you might know. Uh, it is a standard XML-based standard used in statistics. Um, so maybe if you work at uh, the Czech Statistical Office or somewhere else, you might be familiar with SDMX. And this RDF data cube vocabulary is based on this XML standard. Um, the prefix here is cube. QB. And uh, again, this is the URL, which uh, you can get, for instance, from the prefix.cc uh, web service. And this is the overview, the conceptual overview of uh, the vocabulary, which now we will go through and um, we'll try to uh, describe the data cube I have shown you using RDF. Now, I have already talked about dimensions, measures, and attributes. So this is the same example. And uh, we now know that uh, the values on the dimensions, when we have those, they identify a single observation. And that observation has some measurement and uh, it may have some attributes like units of measure, scaling factors, maybe a status saying that this is an estimated value or um, this is an exact value and final value and so on. For instance, when you think about the election results, uh, there can be estimated number of votes. And then when the results are final, this uh, attribute will change to final or something. So dimensions, measures, and attributes. So let's uh, try to take a look at this example and try to describe the dimensions, the measures, and the attributes, and the observed values. We'll start with uh, dimensions. So here, uh, the, the whole uh, data cube vocabulary is centered around uh, what is called an observation. And you can imagine it as the cell of, of this table. That's the observation. So if the observation is the main entity, you need to be able to say that this observation actually has Cardiff on the area dimension, female on the sex dimension, and 2004 to 2006 on the time dimension. For that, you need some predicates. So uh, you can define your own. We, it is a predicate, so it is an RDF property based on the RDFS vocabulary that we talked about last time. So using that, we will create a predicate. We'll say that it is a cube dimension property, which means it is a predicate used to connecting observations to the values of uh, one of the dimensions. 
And uh, it has, of course, a human readable label, which says reference area. We'll do the same for the time dimension. So again, a new predicate. It is an RDF property. It is a cube dimension property. And this is a reference period. And we'll use those predicates to actually connect uh, the observation to the values on, uh, well, in this case, on the area, in this case, the, the per period uh, dimension. Now, um, because the RDF vocabulary is based on the SDMX standard, as I mentioned before, this, the SDMX standard itself already has some dimension properties and measure properties uh, defined in, in the standard. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, the area and uh, period properties are very common in statistics. So a lot uh, of statistics use um, uh, area and time to, to identify a measurement. So for those, there are already defined predicates which we could use directly. However, in this case, we chose to create our own predicates because we want to be able to say that uh, the range of, of this reference period is this interval class from some interval vocabulary. Uh, and uh, the range of the area predicate is this unitary authority class from some other vocabulary. We cannot say that about the SDMX uh, dimension property and because if we did that, it would apply to all instances of the generic SDMX dimension um, property in all data sets in the world, uh, which we do not want to say. We want to say that in our data cube, the range is this interval and in our data cube, the range of uh, the area is this unitary authority. Uh, and we do not want to say it about other data cubes, which would use the SDMX dimension and SDMX, um, uh, the, the ref period and ref area dimensions from SDMX. However, we still want to um, want people and, and machines working with our data to be able to understand what our new predicates mean. Uh, and uh, we can do that by actually saying that our new predicate is a subproperty of the generic dimension property. In both cases, this in this case, the ref area and ref period, which means Again, the, the, the mechanism of subpropertying uh, we discussed. It means that whenever an observation is connected using our predicate to some interval, it can be interpreted as if it was connected by the generic dimension property here to that interval. And this property everyone understands because it is part of the standard. And therefore, we have our own predicate defined uh, more precisely with the range. And it is also connected to the generic one uh, from the SDMX. Right, so those are dimensions. Uh, let's talk a little bit about measures. So here, again, we need a predicate connecting the observation to the measured value. Uh, so again, we create an, a new RDF property uh, because again, we want to be able to say in this case that the range is uh, XML schema decimal. Um, and it doesn't make sense to define this for all data cubes in the world. It applies to our data cube. So we need uh, to create our own uh, predicate for that. But still we want people to, uh, and machines to be able to understand that this life expectancy is actually uh, an observed value, which is a measure property defined in SDMX. So again, we create the sub property of relation here. So now we finally know what is the number uh, which appears in our example. It is the life expectancy. Um, right, so yeah, this is, this is it. Now um, the measure, uh, the measure uh, properties and the uh, dimension properties and the attribute properties, which as you will see later, are used to connect to attribute values. They are commonly, uh, refers to as component properties. So in RDF, the data cube has components and the, each component can be either a dimension, a measure or an attribute. Uh, <clears throat> each of the component properties can uh, be related to a concept. 
such as currency. Um, this is just saying that, yeah, the, the dimension or the measurement has something to do with, let's say, currency. Um, the thing here is that uh, actually, uh, when something has to do with a currency, you don't know whether this is a dimension property or a measurement uh, measure property. And that's because in some data cubes, currency can be used as a dimension. For instance, when you have um, currency exchange rates, you have two dimensions, both are currencies, and the measurement is the exchange rate. Then you have uh, um, prices time series, for instance, where you measure price of some uh, some item in an eShop. And then the currency concept is uh, used as an attribute because you track the price and the, uh, the price is the number, the measurement, and um, the currency of that number similar to units of some measurement is the attribute here. So uh, when you want to say that some component dimension, measure, or an attribute has something to do with some concept. You can specify it like this with the cube concept predicate. So here we have our reference period and reference area, and uh, we have it connect connected to uh, the concept of reference area and the concept of reference period from SDMX. So like this, we have quite nicely defined dimension properties to be used for uh, area and period. And uh, this covers this portion of uh, the vocabulary where we have the component properties connected to some concepts. And uh, the component properties are dimension properties, attribute properties, or uh, measurement properties. Um, there is one special one, uh, measure type, which um, is a dim dimension property uh, defined directly in the vocabulary. And we will get to that one a little bit later. But now, uh, let's uh, talk about a data structure definition. Um, having the predicates for connecting observations to the values of dimensions and measure measures and attributes, um, we want to be able to say that we will have a data cube with some measurements, which will be described using those defined components. So, we need a data structure definition saying this. So this is kind of a schema of the actual statistical cube saying which dimensions, which, which measurements and which attributes the cube has. So we have a data structure definition. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, all those dimensions, measures and attributes are components. So the data structure definition consists of components and each component can be either a dimension, a measure, or an attribute. And in the data structure definition, we say which predicate, which is our reference area, reference period, or the standard uh, SDMX dimension sex here, or the attribute and uh, the measure uh, predicate or property, which is used to actually connect the instances of the observations to the values. So here we can see that we have a three dimensional cube, which will use the reference area, reference period, and SDMX dimension sex uh, dimensions. It will measure, uh, it will have one measure, life expectancy, and it will have one attribute saying the units. And now we can see that this attribute needs to be specified for every observation. And this component attachment actually says that the attribute value is specified uh, on the level of data set. Uh, for now, let's just ignore these two. We will get back to those. So we have a data structure definition pointing to the predicates used for dimensions, measures, and attributes. Viewing the data cube through the um, data structure definition, we can see something like this. So we can see we will have a cube with periods, areas, sexes, and here with some measured numbers. Right, so now that uh, we know um, uh, how the cube will look like, we'll finally get to the instances of the measured values, the observations. Um, they are connected to each other. So we now uh, have uh, the data structure definition and 
Now, when we have a specific instance of the data cube, there can be multiple instances of data cubes having the same structure definition. Um, the instance of the data cube is an instance of the cube data set class. Now, um, uh, here, careful about this one because here the D and the S is capital, uh, capital S, and this is a common mistake. Then when you have your data cube data that you have uh, the class data set with uh, lowercase s, then it wouldn't work. It is capital S. And the instance of the data set points to the structure, which is the data structure definition. And it has the observations. Now, the class observation here is the class of the actual observations. Um, each observation then belongs to a data set, and the data set is the class representing a specific data cube with specific measurements. Uh, right. And here we have an example of a data cube with one uh, measurement. On the top, and, and again, it is based on the same example here. On the top, we have an uh, instance, which is a data set. So this represents the whole data cube. It is a label and a structure. This is the data structure definition that we had uh, in the previous slide. And then we have an instance of an observation here. This observation belongs to this data set because it is part of this cube. Uh, and uh, on the ref area, it points to some entity, Newport 00PR, which represents the city of Newport here. On the uh, ref period, um, dimension it points to some kind of representation of the 2004 to 2006 interval uh, i will get back to this representation in a moment just know that this uri is the representation of this interval then on the sex dimension it points to males and from these three uh, values i know that uh, newport male and 2004 to 2006 uh, i'm talking about this observation here the observation corresponds to the to the cell now I want to be able to say what, what is the measured value. So here uh, we have um, the uh, measure property that we defined pointing to 76.7. And we have an attribute saying that this is in years. So this is the SDMX, the standard attribute unit measure and pointing to DVpedia resource uh, representing a year. So like this, this is a full description of this observation right here. And like this, we would describe all the observations in the data cube, all belong to the data cube. And this uh, is represented by the cube data set predicate here. Again, note that this is cube data set with lowercase d, which is the predicate, and to not the cube data set with capital D, which is the class for, uh, for the data cubes. Right, so this, these are the basics of the data cube vocabulary. We are now going to add some, uh, some more uh, things that you can uh, use, uh, but this should be the basics um, that should cover all your needs. So if you have any questions, ask them, ask them now. Yep. Um, you mean when you are, for instance, uh, transforming your, your original data set into this representation? Well, um, there is a generic tool which we will work with today, uh, in today's tutorial for transforming CSV data into RDF. Um, then you have uh, generic tools like XSLT for transforming XML data into uh, whatever, such as RDF. And then um, in JSON, you can add a JSON LD context to create RDF file out of JSON. So those are generic. They are not specific to the data cube vocabulary. There is no specific tool for a data cube vocabulary. However, you can use those techniques uh, to specify uh, the transformation so that uh, you can run it automatically then. Uh, but you need to specify these manually. So you need to create your, uh, your predicates or you need to know that you want to reuse the standard ones. Uh, you need to know 
how this should look like. And you need to describe it, for instance, using Sparkle, uh, the tool for uh, transformation of CSV data to, uh, to RDF called Tarco, which we'll work with today, is based on Sparkle construct queries. So you will create this as a template in Sparkle construct, and you will fill those uh, values from the CSV file, for instance. So this is um, how far you can go with the automation, basically. Other questions? If not, I now expect that this is clear. And uh, if you have some statistics in your data, uh, for the second phase of uh, the semester project, I will expect you to use the data queue vocabulary. For the first phase, you do not have to use any proper vocabularies. Uh, so the, it will be fine if you represent your statistics in another way. But uh, for the final um, project, um, use the data cube vocabulary for statistics. Right. Uh, yeah, so now graphically, um, this points to the data set, which represents the whole data cube. Uh, these values of the dimensions are those values uh, connected to the observation, which represents the cell uh, using the predicates that we have defined. And uh, this is the measure. Right. Uh, now, going back to uh, the way I have represented uh, the interval 2004 to 2006, in RDF. There is a British service uh, which allows you to actually uh, have URIs for all time instants and time intervals. So this URI actually uh, represents an instant, which is the 1st of uh, January in 2004, and it is uh, midnight. So this is XML schema date time uh, syntax. And when you use it, you actually get the resource. And about that resource, you can get some interesting data in RDF, such as um, this was a Thursday, it is in January, and uh, some, some other uh, data, such as that the year is 2004, and some human readable representation of this instant. The same goes for the interval that uh, we had there, 2004 to 2006. Um, again, it was using this British service. Um, it is fine to use this British service. Uh, you, you can also see that there is a XML schema uh, representation of the same uh, instant here. So you can use that on the uh, time dimension of your data cubes. And if someone is interested, they will be able to get some additional data about those time instants and time intervals such as these. Um, right. Now uh, I'll talk about the component attachment, which I told you before to ignore. So now we are going to talk about it. Um, note that uh, here we have the observation and we have the attribute here, the unit measure, um, saying that the value is in years. Now this, uh, or using these triples, we will represent all the observations in the data queue, which means that for each observation, we will have a triple that the observation has a unit, um, units of measurement years. This might be unnecessary because in our example, the whole data cube is in years and we could say just once uh, and not for each observation. And that's what the component attachment is for. This says about the attribute component that it is attached to uh, observation. Here we have uh, in our data uh, structure definition, we would say component attachment observation. When we don't say anything in the data structure definition, this is by default. And it means that the value of the attribute or the, the component here is attribute. So value of this attribute can be found uh, with the observation which means it needs to be repeated for every observation. We can have the component attachment specified on the cube data set level here, which means that the value for the attribute is find, found with the data set instance, and then it doesn't have to be repeated with the observations. So this is an optimization because 
you can just say with one triple that all the measurements are in years and be done with it. However, the data cube vocabulary supports a more generic data cube where every uh, measured value can be measured in another uh, or in, in different units or using different units, which is a bit weird, but you can specify that. Right, so that's the component attachment. Um, now, sometimes it happens that for one observation, you have multiple measurements. For instance, uh, if you measure, uh, I don't know what you can measure, something with your cell phone, which has many different sensors, um, and you measure the values on all those sensors in one moment, you'll get multiple measurements. And now, when you have this situation, there are two basic approaches to how to represent this in uh, the idea of data cube vocabulary. Actually, there are three when I think about it. You can say that for each measurement, such as, uh, um, I don't know, the position, the current time, the current temperature, and so on. So for each of those, you can have a separate RDF, um, a separate data cube. So you'll have one data cube, uh, which would be a time series of, uh, I don't know, the, the temperature. Another would be a time series of your battery levels. And one would be just a sequence of your uh, GPS position or something like that. So you can split those into three data cubes. That's one, uh, one option. Another option is that you can, um, put all of those measurements into one data cube. And then you have to deal with the fact that attributes are actually attributes of the observation and not of the individual measurements. Uh, so when you attach multiple measurements, multiple components of the measurement type to one observation, they need to share all the attribute values, which is not usable for the example where we measure um, GPS position and uh, temperature because those have different units. And because the units can be specified only on the observation level, you cannot have one observation with these two measurements and uh, still be able to say which uh, units are used for which measurement. If you want to be able to say this, you need to add another dimension, which is the special cube measure type dimension specified in the, uh, um, in the overview of the vocabulary which distinguishes between the individual measurements um, represented in each observation. We'll have an example. Here, we have another data structure definition. This is shipments by time. And here we have four components. One is the dimension in time. And here we have weight and quantity of some item which is being shipped. So those are two different measures. And those two different measures will have two different units uh, because weight uses different units than quantity. Uh, this means that to represent those two measures, we need two separate observations, and we need to distinguish those observations with the uh, type of the measure used in those observations, which is a special dimension because we need to know the measure type <clears throat> and in addition to the time to be able to identify the proper observation. And here we have the two observations. One, uh, both belong to the same data set, data set two. Both are from the same time. Uh, one uses the weight measure, one uses the quantity measure, and they are distinguished using the measure type uh, dimension here. The value of the measure type dimension are again the, the measure properties used in that particular observation. So this is one approach. Um, the other approach, uh, looks like this. When we have uh, no measure type dimension, we would just have one observation with two measures. But here, we cannot specify the units because the units would apply to both measures, which uh, is something we do not want. So these are three ways of dealing with uh, multiple measured values. Um, yeah, right. Okay, so um, now you should be able to re uh, represent a data cube like this one in RDF. Now, there are also some operations which you can do with uh, a data cube like this. And one of those operations is slicing. So you can slice the data cube. And what does it mean? Well, it means that you um, fix the value of 
one of the dimensions. For instance, here, we fix the value of the sixth dimension to nail, which means that we'll end up with a data cube, which has uh, one less dimension. So this is a two dimensional data cube, um, which has one dimension, the, the period and another dimension, the area. And uh, I can do this again. I can fix the, uh, the area to Cardiff. And now I have a one dimensional data cube, which just has measurements for different time periods. When you have a one dimensional data cube with uh, the dimension being time, this is called a time series. I could uh, do another slice uh, and uh, fix uh, the time. And I would get another one dimensional data cube where the dimension would be the area. And uh, yeah, uh, the, when, when the dimension is time, it is called a time series. When the three dimension is not time, it is called a section. So this is a section one dimensional data cube where the dimension is not a time based dimension. And this operation is called slicing. When we say, okay, we will fix the value of one of the dimensions to something and we'll get a less dimensional data cube called a slice. And the, these slices can be stored um, in, the, in the data along with the data cube. Um, when we do the slicing and we want to explicitly represent the slice in the data, um, we again need to be able to say which dimensions are fixated. Um, in, this, uh, in this instance, we have the data structure definition and uh, the data structure definition for slices is called the slice key. So here we say there is a slice key called slice by region. And slice by region is a slice key which points to the um, components which have a fixated value. So we say that we fixate reference period and we fixate the sex uh, dimension. We end up with a slice by region because what we end up with is a one dimensional data cube that, uh, and the only three dimension is the region uh, dimension here. Uh, so this is a slice key. And then we have the actual slice, which is a group of observations from the data cube. So here we have a data set saying that the data set has an explicit slide, slice defined. The slice, of course, is an instance of slice, points to the slice key and points to the observation belonging to that slice. So here we say that the, this slice contains these observations and those are the individual observations belonging to uh, the slice. Then the observations are the same. They are the same as they were in uh, the original data cube. However, uh, we can use this slicing again with component attachment because we can say that uh, some components uh, are attached to the slice, such as the reference period and uh, the sex dimension. And uh, then in the definition of the slide, uh, slice, we say that uh, this is a slice where uh, sex is male and the period is 2004 to 2006. And we point to individual observations where we do not have to repeat those values. And then the observation just says it belongs to this data set. The area is the city and the life expectancy is the measured value. So again, slices can be used either for pointing out that there are some interesting slices in the data and they can be used to optimize the number of triples necessary to actually represent the data queue. Uh, right, we are nearing the end uh, of this. Uh, there is one other uh, construct. Uh, when, um, <clears throat> when I showed you the dimensions, some of those were actually represented by SCOS concept schemes. That's why we talked about SCOS before. Uh, and it is quite natural then that when you have uh, some dimension such as sexes, those are represented as SCOS concept scheme and male and female are the concepts from that concept scheme. When this is the case, you can uh, use the cube code list to point to that concept scheme from some dimension property saying that the values on this, on this dimension are from the 
uh, scores concept scheme. However, um, the data queue vocabulary is not dependent on this. Uh, the dimensions here can be also represented using any hierarchical code list, not using scores. But if that is the case, you need to at least specify the hierarchy root, which are the top concepts, and then the parent child property used to point from the top concepts to lower concepts, which would normally be scores narrower. But if you have another representation of a hierarchy, you can also describe it for the usage in data queue like this. But it is better or more, more common to just use SCOS concept scheme. Right, so this is uh, the data queue vocabulary. We talked about the component properties and the measure type here. Um, now uh, we talked about the concept. We talked about the data structure definition and the components. We talked about data sets, slices, slice keys, observations. Uh, and this is just an abstract observation group actually not used in the data. So um, yeah, so we basically covered the entire uh, data queue vocabulary. Now the question is, is this vocabulary actually used somewhere in the data? The answer is yes. For instance, we have the Czech Social Security Administration, which publishes uh, pension statistics in uh, RDF data cube vocabulary uh, representation. So if you want to take a look at how uh, a real world data set can look like in um, RDF data cube, uh, take a look at uh, the Czech Social Security Administration. They have many data sets using the data cube vocabulary there. Uh, another example, uh, this is a European project uh, that dealt with uh, uh, dealt with uh, budgets of, uh, of companies and uh, state administration and so on. And again, those budgets were represented as RDF data cubes. So those are just two examples uh, which you can take a look at. Uh, there are of course more because this is the standard for representing statistics on the web of data. Right, any questions? If not, I'll see you uh, in the evening um, for the tutorial where we will uh, try to transform some CSV files into RDF um, using Tarkle. Okay, so see you uh, in the evening.